Welcome back, everyone. This is the second part of our podcast with Dr. Richard Main. Richard has completed his medical degree from Queen's University Belfast School of Medicine. He went on to complete a master's degree in sport and exercise medicine at Ulster University while undertaking training as a general practitioner. He is now practicing as a general practitioner in Northern Ireland in the UK. He is passionate about the research of sedentary behavior and physical activity to share information and help people live longer, happier and healthier lives. He is also running a website called themovingmedic.net. In this second part, we are going to discuss Richard's, Richard's research on the physical activity of general practitioners in the UK. The effect of that on the doctors and on the advice they give to their patients. So, welcome back, Richard. Thank you. So we're now going to discuss your research, and it's it's very, very interesting. I have had the privilege to familiarize myself with your latest research about sedentary behavior among GPs. It's not public yet, but could you tell our listeners what exactly did you look at in your study? Yes. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned in the first part of the podcast, uh, I work in general practice and uh in doing so during my training to be a general practitioner, uh, I moved from working in emergency medicine when I was on my feet and moving around all the time to then working in general practice when I found that I was sitting down almost all of the working day. Um, so off the back of that, I undertook some research myself just to see what evidence there was for sedentary behavior and physical activity and how this impacts health. Um, and I was amazed to find the emerging evidence uh, linking excessive sedentary behavior with uh, adverse health outcomes uh, and increased all-cause mortality. Um, so I then kind of thought uh, that this is quite uh, scary as a GP because as a GP, my experience of it was we spend a lot of time sitting down throughout the working day. Um, so I was kind of concerned about that from a personal perspective, perspective in terms of how it was affecting, it would be affecting my health moving forwards, but also uh, from a wider perspective in terms of how GPs speak to their patients about physical activity and lifestyle choices, if they're potentially not really following the advice themselves. Um, and so there, there, we decided to to look into this further. Um, so there there is previous research that is fairly well established that shows that GPs and clinicians who are more physically active are more likely to recommend physical activity to their patients because they see the benefits of that in their own lives. Uh, but also there's further research that shows that patients are more likely to follow the advice from their clinician if they believe that their clinician follows the advice themselves. Um, so we then thought it was relevant to explore exactly how much time GPs spend sitting down every day because, uh, and to determine whether this is at a level that is potentially affecting their health um, and, and also their ability mm -hmm. to counsel patients. Um, so uh, I undertook research as part of the uh, general practice academic research training scheme at Queen's University Belfast where I was supervised by Professor Nigel Hart and Dr. Neil Heron. I was very fortunate with my supervisors in that they have backgrounds in general practice and also in sport and exercise medicine. And we collaborated with uh, Ulster University with Professor Mark Tully and uh, Dr. Jason Wilson, as well as uh, uh, Associate Professor Jan Christian Braun, who's at the University of Southern Denmark. And what we looked at was to work out exactly how much time GPs spend sitting down every day. So we initially undertook a uh, questionnaire survey of GPs working in Northern Ireland to uh, find out uh, using their uh, own estimation of how much time they spend sitting down. And that was based on the International Sedentary Assessment Tool, uh, which is a validated questionnaire uh, to, to assess sedentary behavior. And yeah, based on the questionnaire findings, it was quite scary. Uh, there was a lot of time spent <laughs> sitting down. Um, and we also, uh, we also um, asked about access to standing desks and active workstations. Um, and actually we did find that a small minority of participants uh, did uh, actually have access to standing desks. Although I suppose we need to caveat, caveat that with the participants to the actually that took part in the in the, the survey are probably more likely to be interested in their own sedentary behavior and physical activity so there may have been mm. some selection bias mm. in that so among all of the gps and gp trainees working in northern ireland uh 
there are almost 2,000 in total, uh, and we had a response of 353 people accessing the survey, which is a response rate of uh, around 18%. Mm. Um, but uh, within that, uh, yeah, we found that uh, there was a lot of time that people were spending sitting down. Um, and <laughs> we asked whether they felt that they were spending more time sitting down now uh, than prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so the questionnaire was disseminated in autumn 2020. Um, and they found that, uh, yeah, the vast majority of people felt that they were spending much more time sitting down. Um, I think it was to the tune of 87% of participants said they were spending a lot more time sitting down than prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then, um, yeah, uh, we wanted to explore this further in more detail because we're aware that uh, the questionnaire surveys aren't always the gold standard in sedentary behavior research. Uh, so we did recruit a smaller uh, subset of participants, uh, 20 participants, to wear uh, an accelerometer on their thigh 24-7 uh, for a week to get an objective measure of their sedentary behavior and physical activity um, and just to compare that with the questionnaire responses. But really, the key take home findings from the research were that uh, the vast majority of the doctors that didn't have access to uh, active workstations, um, that they were averaging around 10 and a half hours of sedentary time every working day. Um, whereas actually those, the small number, uh, the 6% that had active workstations like sit stand desks, uh, they had over two mm -hmm. hours less uh, sedentary time throughout the course of a working day. Mm -hmm. um, and as we were also looking at uh, the doctors that were working, uh, the GP trainees that were working in hospital settings that weren't working in general practice, but were doing hospital rotations, we actually found that they had uh, around the same amount of sedentary time as the doctors in general practice with the standing desks. So they averaged around uh, eight hours of sedentary time throughout the course of a working day, which shows mm -hmm. that uh, the people working in general practice are much more sedentary, uh, you know, by certainly over two hours mm -hmm. uh, on a typical working day than, than doctors working in hospital. So another thing to kind of uh, so, tie um, into that is, is yeah. that... Uh, uh, with the original sedentary behaviour research was done by the epidemi epidemiologist uh, Jeremy Morris in London in post-World War II London uh, among bus drivers and bus conductors uh, and they he found that uh, the bus, uh, bus drivers unfortunately were much more sedentary but they also had uh, they, they had higher rates of mortality from cardiovascular disease than the more physically active conductors so I suppose the research that we have found is that you could almost say that doctors working in general practice are the the sedentary bus drivers of the of the medical world, uh, with maybe the colleagues in hospital being com more comparable with bus conductors potentially. <laughs> so, um, how long is a typical working day in a in general uh, for a general practitioner? What yeah, are so the working the, hours? Yeah, the working hours of a, the in hours service runs uh, from. 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, Monday Monday to Friday during the weekdays, and then out of hours cover is provided by the out of hours service. Um, so a lot of GPs would typically be in uh, in the, in the practice uh, between 8 and 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, so. And especially with the, the increased amount of uh, remote consulting happening with telephone and video consulting as a result mm. of the COVID-19 pandemic, that has traditionally been done while sitting down as, as well as all of the computer work mm. as well. Um, so that's mm. uh, probably the reason why there is so much uh, sedentary behavior now. Yeah. So uh, how widely pe people or general practitioners are, are aware of, of the health risks uh comp like the sedentary behavior related health risks I'm, I'm sure they are like generally aware but are they aware that there is a, a huge difference whether you sit seven hours a day or ten and a half hours a day how how much do you think people are aware I think there's actually quite a lack of awareness specifically of the mm -hmm. health risks associated with excessive sedentary behavior. I think certainly in the we, we did conduct interviews with uh, with some of the participants that wore the accelerometers uh, as a follow up uh, research study. Um, and actually their awareness of the health consequences of physical uh, inactivity uh, were, were very good. 
But uh, in general, I think there is a lack of awareness of the health risks associated with excessive sedentary behavior, particularly. Um, and I think uh, people aren't really aware of, of how much this can potentially impact their health. Um, and it, it, it is quite scary mm-hmm. in terms of when you look at the dose, uh, dose response relationship with uh, excessive sedentary behavior um, and the adverse health outcomes that uh, a 10 and a half hours a day of, of sedentary behavior does put people at higher risk of those adverse health outcomes. Yeah. And from your research, uh, I, I read that uh, during days off, general practitioners were were um, more active than average. I think uh, there was qu- not so much sedentary sedentary time during days off. That's that right. Correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, and certainly in the accelerometer study, we were very pleased with the the amount of physical activity on on days off because we were able to explore more about physical activity with the subset of participants that wore the accelerometers. But um, yeah, I think that many of them had step counts uh, in excess of 10,000 steps on their days off work. Mm-hmm. But in general, the step counts on working days were less, were half or less of their, their non-work day step count. So it does show that uh, certainly, and that's probably the awareness of the benefits of physical activity that uh, they are uh, mm. excuse the pun, but taking steps to, uh, to, 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 to be physically active on their days off work. Um, but, uh, I think it's, it's important to explain the message about uh, the excessive sedentary behavior on throughout the working days, because most, uh, most doctors spend more days, you know, that there are more working days in the week than there are days off work. So it's important to consider the whole, mm. uh, the whole week, uh, and not just days off work. So, uh, what, in your opinion, could be done in uh, in the UK to what could be done to improve the situation? What would be maybe the one or two interventions that you could do to improve the situation of general practitioners when it comes to sitting down too too long? Uh, yeah. So uh, another study that we're another team that we're collaborating with are actually uh, based in Loughborough University, uh, which is uh, um, Greg Biddle and Amanda Daly, and they are actually looking at uh, standing desks in the general practice setting. So it'll be interesting to see the outcomes of of that. Uh, and certainly, that is one thing that you can do because it does allow you, especially if you're. If, if I mean personally, and and from speaking with with other GPs that use standing desks, um, it's it, it's straightforward to do when you're consulting remotely with the patient on the phone, um, because mm-hmm. it doesn't affect the consultation. However, I think there are some concerns about how uh, it would affect the interaction with patients if you were standing and the patient was sitting. If they're coming mm-hmm. in for a face to face consultation which are happening mm-hmm. increasingly frequently now uh, with restrictions lifting related to COVID-19. So um, I think the ability, I think it's still important to, to maintain the patient doctor interaction and, and maintain that relationship uh, at, a, at, a, at a, as good a quality as possible. And personally, whenever I have patients coming into the consulting room, I would always be sitting down uh, when they're coming in mm-hmm. uh, because we don't want it to be turning into, you know, this sort of environment of an emergency department or a orthopedic <laughs> fracture clinic, which are, you know, much, much, uh, much more to the point and much more objective driven uh, than with a more relational approach of general practice. But standing desks are certainly one way of potentially re- reducing sedentary behavior. Um, but other things are mm-hmm. um taking active breaks during the working day. Um, so uh, it's it's again related to workload but certainly at during lunch break uh if you have the time trying to get outside and and clear your head and and go out for a walk um and actually in doing so you might set a good example to patients that are in the area and they think oh there's the the doctor out walking uh that's maybe something that i should be doing as well um but there 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 are there, there are also concerns uh from speaking with other gps that uh that if they're seen out walking during the working day, then patients will be thinking, um, oh, I'm having difficulty getting an appointment with my doctor and they're getting out walking during the day. I mean, what are they doing there? So mm-hmm. it's important to to kind of consider the the um, negative, uh, the things that are holding, the barriers that are holding people back from being more physically active. Um, 
But uh, yeah, other things uh, that you can do, there's the concept of exercise snacks. So um, where you, you take a couple of minutes just to do lunges or squats. Um, if you if you have that opportunity, depending on workload during the working day, but uh, it might actually mean you're more efficient moving forwards if you actually take that time out to to clear your head and then get back to work again. Mm. Um, but that's another another option. Um, and then there's there's things like uh, active commuting to and from work, uh, you know, walking or cycling to work instead of uh, instead of driving or um, or other sedentary modes of transport. So. There are lots of things that are out there that people can do. Uh, so it's just trying to integrate that into the working day and seeing the importance of that as well. Um, and another thing, yeah, I, I mentioned about the call screen uh, that's present in many uh, G general practices, uh, which calls people from the waiting room into the consulting room so that you're sitting down the whole mm -hmm. time. But actually getting rid of those or turning them off is much better because you can, a lot of people would say the consultation begins in the waiting room. And actually, you can probably diagnose a lot of conditions based on the person walking from the waiting room to the consulting room. You can pick up things like Parkinson's disease based on people's gait. Um, so actually, that uh, I think, yeah, certainly intercoms, call screens, they should be uh, thrown in the bin and people encouraged to, to walk to greet the patients instead, uh, providing the workload allows. I couldn't agree with you more on that, but you had great, uh, great points there because um, from previous podcasts, I've been talking to people about the implementation of exercise into treatment, but also it's so easy to say that I would just buy a standing desk. But as you said, it doesn't maybe work in the setting of having a patient there. And, uh, and I, and the, the, how do you say the, just like going and getting your patient, walking with them, seeing how they walk, what's the posture. You can diagnose so many things or at least maybe not diagnose, but you can see the patient. So, yeah, we should get rid of those. <laughs> but uh, uh, you already answered so many uh, in so many ways what I want to ask you. But we know from research that doctors who are physically active themselves, that people or patients tend to believe their suggestions about physical act, active being more physical active um, more. So why do you think this is? Because basically patients don't know whether a doctor is physically active or not. So how would you answer that? Uh, well, I suppose uh, it wouldn't be very good if, uh, you know, if, if a patient came in to see a doctor and they were sitting with a cigarette in their hand and a <laughs> bottle of whiskey on the table, that wouldn't be setting a very good example. So if you draw the same conclusion to sitting down, uh, which also has a you know negative effect on health, then also that's not setting a very good example. Um, I think the some of this there was certainly one study that was done that looked at the uh, the ability of, of of doctors to consult patients about lifestyle behaviors, um, and one was as simple as uh, they had I think it was the same doctor, but they. They had one with a cycling helmet and an apple sitting on their desk and then one with the doctor without the same thing on their desk. And I think they said the same, they said the same advice to the patients, but the patients uh, were much more likely to act on the advice than the doctor that had the cycling helmet and the, the apple on their desk. Uh, so it is, yeah, it's a very, very simple thing. Um, but I think you have to practice what you preach mm. uh, because um, otherwise you're not setting a very good example. Um and yeah, I think it's something to be mm. mindful of. I also think so. You, people can usually tell whether you believe into what you say or not. Um, so one of the goals of this podcast is to bring researchers and clinicians together. And uh, I've been asking this from many, many of uh, my guests. Do you use any uh, devices or any any technical devices to assess the physical activity of your patients? Well, I mentioned that we used accelerometers in the study mm -hmm. with the doctors themselves, but I think using that with patients uh, would be quite difficult. The patient, the, the accelerometers that we were using were thigh worn underneath uh, adhesive dressing on the thigh, uh, which um, is potentially quite difficult with patients themselves. Uh, so generally in terms of assessing a patient's physical activity i wouldn't use any formal questionnaire i would simply ask them 
what sort of activity do you do? Um, because um, that's often the easiest way of, of kind of calculating it and getting a rough estimate in your head without needing to worry about met minutes or met hours or, uh, or things that are more complicated like that. Um, because that also gives you the baseline of which, uh, what, where they're at. And some people, it's simply just encouraging them to maintain that, whereas other people, it's encouraging them to do more. Um, and occasionally, it may also be relevant to actually advise them to do less. So um, mm. I, I, I think in, in future, I think if there were... Uh, good objective ways of gathering that data that might be helpful for some patients that are more um, motivated. Uh, but I think patients that are less motivated to change the behavior would probably be reluctant to wear something that's tracking them all the time. Uh, and there are lots of wearables and things that are out there. Um, so I suppose it'll be interesting to see how the, the landscape changes moving forwards. Uh, and whether there is more uptake of that among the general population and not just the people that are kind of really into their health and fitness that really are the ones that are most likely to be wearing them at the moment. Mm, okay. Um, so um, do you already have your next research project going um, on? What would you like to uh, do research-wise in the future? Well, yeah, we we ended up uh, that was made, you know quite a quantitative study that we were looking at in terms of getting the baseline data regarding the exact amount of time that GP spends sitting down throughout the working day. Um, so actually, off the back of that, uh, we've been conducting interviews uh, with uh, with some of the participants to find out more about the barriers and facilitators to them being less sedentary and more physically active, particularly throughout the working day. Um, so. Now it's uh, working on trying to um, analyze those interviews, uh, which is a qualitative approach, um, which I've actually really enjoyed mm -hmm. having those conversations with uh, other GPs. Uh, and it has been very enlightening um, and in some ways very encouraging, but also in some ways a little bit disheartening at uh, the difficulty of actually changing that behavior. Um, but yeah, that's something that we're continuing mm -hmm. to work on. Um, so watch this space uh, because that will hopefully be be uh, something that'll be uh, coming out moving moving forwards. I know you don't have probably the results yet, but uh, like what have been the barriers that people have told you? So because like general practitioners, they already know they they have a really good knowledge. They still have barriers to be physically more active. So what have you heard? Uh, so barriers, workload is a big factor uh, where people feel that uh, they they don't even have time. Like some some people I've been speaking to were saying they don't even have time to take a break at lunchtime uh, to get out and you know go for a walk uh, because if they really work through their lunch break to try and leave close to on time at the end of the day and they feel mm. that if they spent 20 or 30 minutes going out for a walk, it would mean that they would be spending 20 or 30 minutes later in work and if they've got a young family or other things that they mm -hmm. want to be doing then that would mean that they mightn't see spend as much time with their family um so uh i think addressing the workload is a key part of it uh to allow people to actually be able to take that time out even during their lunch break which should be their own time um but unfortunately mm -hmm. isn't always at the moment um and there was somebody even brought up an example of another doctor who um, who they worked with, who, who actually brought a flask of coffee to work to sit on their desk because they didn't even feel like they had time to go to the coffee, you know, to the to, to the kitchen to get a, a to make themselves a cup of coffee. Um, so yeah, things like that are certainly big barriers related to the workload. Um, and then there's some things that were um, both barriers and facilitators because it depended on the location of the practice where they were working. Um, because if it was in a nice area with a nice somewhere to go for a walk beside, then that meant they were much more likely to want to go out and actually exercise during the working day, as opposed to if it was mm -hmm. somewhere that was in a very built up, uh, confined environment without much green space, then they were less likely to, to go out walking. Um, Climate also is a factor, uh, certainly in in Ireland, where mm. um, it's uh, it can be quite wet. Uh, that was also a limitation. <laughs> but then on a nicer day, people were more likely to go out. I also mentioned the fact that uh, there was the, some some people were thinking it was a, it was potentially a good thing that people would be seeing them out and about. But I think in general, uh, doctors mm. prefer 
they weren't being uh, seen too much by patients that would recognize them because they could pretend they were concerned about uh, patients coming up to them and saying, uh, oh, can you can I speak to about about this? Can you can you have a look at this rash or or something that you know interrupting them whenever they're really trying to switch off? Um, yeah, yeah. As well as feeling that the oh the doctors have got too much time to to, to if they're able to get out for a walk during the working day. Um, so yeah, there's lots of things that that, that play into it. Um, but those are just some of the the, the things that were were brought up. Uh, it's great examples. There should be a back door so that you can, you know, go out without no one seeing you and then a restricted area of, of walking and then you can go back and, you know, yeah, you need to, need see to you. <laughs> have, a, have a disguise. Uh, yeah, I would wear a cap during the summertime to avoid getting sunburned. But uh, yeah, I suppose that's maybe a way of going incognito. Uh, yeah, having some sort of disguise that you're, you're not, uh, people yeah. aren't seeing you. Yeah, like a warm-up stadium or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, and and last but definitely not least, um, how can our listeners reach you? Um, you're active on Twitter and Instagram, so tell our listeners how to reach you or contact you if they want to do so. Uh, yeah, the easiest way is just on on Twitter or Instagram is the Moving Medic, uh, and then even if you just Google the Moving Medic, uh, that should probably. Uh, find me uh, and I'd be happy to to connect and engage with with anybody that was was interested in, in what we're doing well thank you so much for 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 sharing your thoughts with us and thank you for all our listeners um, we will see you next Sunday with a new guest bye bye <laughs>